He's back. Russell Engelman, the man who shrunk the dunk, and who I would call a friend despite not actually knowing him when I made my first video about Dunkleosteus, he's come back with more publications on Dunkleosteus, and in this case about its jaws. As for Dunkleosteus, for a long time it was known as a massive 30 foot long 10 meter behemoth from the Devonian oceans, the top predator in all of those oceans, and was dwarfing all other animals with its size. And that is partially correct. It still would have been the top predator, and it was large, but more tuna than eel-shaped, closer to 12 to 15 feet at most, between 4 and 5 meters, and that 5 meters would have been an exceptionally large individual. So really, around 4 meters rather than 10 should be the expected length of it. And that's fine, it's still a big fish, and Russell Engelman here is able to actually show that it was potentially even more dangerous than we would have initially given it credit for. And that's because Russell Engelman and the co-authors asked how did its jaws work beyond just, hey, they kind of bite somehow. This requires an understanding of the skull and the mandible of Dunkleosteus. And to be honest, this has been a really, really long time coming. The last time a full reconstruction of the muscles in the head of Dunkleosteus happened was in Heinz 1932. It's been a while. Now, in the 40s, there were a few more papers that added a few more observations for different muscles, but still, that's the 1940s. This has been needed. This is particularly true because of the Australian Gogo Lagerstatt, which is actually one of the best marine formations in the world because its preservation is just so, so incredible. There's a 3D preserved umbilical cord in that formation, as well as a number of smaller arthrodeers, the armored fish of which Dunkleosteus is one, but from Ohio, not Australia. The 3D preservation of the Gogo formation makes an animal like Compago Pisces a great point of comparison, because you can see just about everything perfectly, or at least as perfectly as you can in a 380 million year old fish. And between Compago Pisces and Dunkleosteus, there's a number of notable differences, once you reconstruct everything at least. And that's because Dunkleosteus, while very bony, is also preserved in a way that many of the bones got distorted and flattened, meaning reconstructions of the muscles took time. However, there's also enough isolated material that you can start to piece it together. And figure two in this paper is incredible. It's one of my favorite figures from any paper like this. Starting at the top, you just have the bones, and there's internal bones and external bones. Fish have a lot of bones in their skull, and so simplifying it to humans, this would be something kind of like the lacrimal bone, where it's more internal to our skull rather than being completely on the outside like the temporal bone that is here on the outside of your skull. But again, many Dunkleosteus fossils are in pieces, and so many of these interior bones are actually pretty accessible, which is really convenient for these authors. And then you get to things like where the cartilage would have been based on things like the McKellian groove. And then finally, you look at the muscles, including one muscle called the preorbital, which it's in front of the eyes, preorbital, and that makes sense there would be a muscle there, but it also just seems so different from everything on land. Fish are weird, and even older fish like arthrodires, even stranger. But this is where the paper shows that our understanding of Dunkleosteus was a bit fishy, and based on kind of just general vibes as opposed to rigorous study, and importantly, comparisons to 3D preserved relatives. So here's the initial reconstruction of the jaw from the update in 1946, where it was kind of just all assumed to be basically one muscle that would have pulled the jaw shut. Meanwhile, in this paper, they were able to show two potential possibilities, although one of them is preferred, and both of them find out a lot of small compartmentalization of the muscle block that actually powered the jaw. This is much more complex than what we see in Compago Pisces, and as for what this means, Dunkleosteus was highly specialized. It wasn't built just like the other arthrodires, and admittedly Engelman did show this with just its body shape, but instead it also would have had larger and more muscles powering the jaws. On the roof of the skull you can see that in these different depressions for muscle attachments that we don't see in other arthrodires. That means is also that it probably wasn't suction feeding. Suction feeding is when fish open their jaws to suddenly make an area of low pressure, which brings in water and also prey, but that requires jaws to open rapidly and expand greatly. Looking at something like a pipefish or seahorse, they have a long narrow snout because when they open the end of that, that whole snout gets to fill with water and presumably the prey if they're lucky. Alternatively, you can have things like frogfish, which have a very, very wide mouth for the same thing. They can pop it open, creates a low pressure area, and the water and prey both get sucked in. But Dunkleosteus was built more like a tuna, so it didn't really have wide jaws, and it didn't really have a long snout like a pipefish or seahorse. So it was doing something different, and it's not really a kind of swallow things whole kind of build. 
Instead, you could see that its giant jaws were built for shearing, and that means it was more likely a ram feeder, meaning the fish goes fast and bites off pieces of prey. Think kind of like a barracuda rather than a frogfish. And it could still open its mouth at a pretty wide angle, but again, narrow mouth so the water is mostly getting out of the way while the prey gets eaten and bitten in half. So yeah, more like a big barracuda basically. The jaws, while not even having teeth, do actually have serrations on the bone, and those vary by individual. In fact, these serrations could be indicative of new species that just haven't been recognized yet, or maybe they just changed over the life of the animal, or changed over evolutionary time and we just don't have a strong signal for that possibility yet. There's lots of options as to how they have these serrations and why they're different, but again, despite Dunkleosteus being the most famous arthrodire, it was not at all a normal arthrodire. With specialized bones and musculature, body shape, and even these bone serrations making it well adapted for open ocean, and especially feeding on large prey, like the stem sharks that have also been found in the Cleveland Shale of Ohio. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Also, thanks to Russell Engelman for reaching out just before this paper was published. It's been a while to get the production going on it, but I really do appreciate when researchers are able to let us know when things are coming so that we can be able to publish when they are ready. So if you're also a publisher or researcher publishing something, let us know.